Hey guys, it's Andrew. Thanks for tuning in to Scary Mysteries today. Forensic science and investigative techniques have certainly improved in the past few decades, but truth be told, criminals and murderers have been getting better at getting away with their crimes as well. According to the FBI, in 2016 alone, nearly half of this country's murder cases went unsolved. And in this episode, we dug deep and we're going to go check out a few of them. There are five bizarre murder mysteries from North Carolina. Number five, UNC Chapel Hill murder. She would have been the first person in her family to graduate from college. A consistent honor student since high school, Faith Hedgespeth was consequently granted a scholarship to attend the prestigious University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. A member of the Halawa Sapani Indian tribe from Hollister, Hedgebeth had been known in her community for having a real passion to help others, especially children. However, her dream of becoming a pediatrician ended with tragedy, and it all began on the morning of September 7th of 2012. Because on this day, the 20-year-old was found dead inside her apartment on Old Chapel Hill Road in Durham. She shared the space with a roommate named Karina Rosario, and it was her and another friend, Marisol Rangel, who discovered the body. The university student was partially nude, her body haphazardly wrapped in a comforter. Blood was all over the place, and the victim had suffered what appeared to be severe head trauma. She was bludgeoned to death by her attacker or attackers, the girls immediately called 911 to inform authorities about what they had discovered. When Faith's family heard the news, it of course came as a shock to everyone back home. Meanwhile, the investigation revealed even more disturbing details about the crime. Police believed the murder weapon was actually an empty Bacardi rum bottle found in the bedroom. It was left behind and had tissue fragments as well as DNA from somebody other than Faith on it. Following up on this lead, more than 100 DNA samples were taken from potential suspects, but so far, there was only about 10 that came close to matching, and most of them were completely cleared off the list of suspects. In a phenotyping procedure done by Parabon Nanolabs, they found out that, based on the genetic footprint left by the suspect, he or she most likely would have been of Native American and European descent. Another interesting thing found at the crime scene was a fast food bag with a handwritten note that read, I'm not stupid, bitch, and jealous. And because of this, police surmised that the victim then most likely knew the perpetrator and that this was personal. Now several years have passed since the initial investigation, but still nothing substantial has been figured out. Just a young woman murdered in her bed by a bottle of liquor on a college campus and no suspects. In 2018, though, an independent group examined evidence from the case and what they concluded was rather intriguing. Because according to them, the key to uncovering the truth in Hedgepeth's murder would be none other than Rosario, her roommate. As to what could be her role in her death exactly, no one knows. However, authorities continue to dig for the truth on what is widely considered one of the strangest and most heartbreaking murder mysteries in recent history in all of North Carolina. Number four, Rhonda Jones, Christina Bennett, and Megan Oxendine. Three bodies within a span of weeks, and despite trying, the police have no information that has helped lead to a real suspect. On April 17, 2017, Christina Bennett was found dead inside an abandoned house on Peachtree Street in Lumberton. Known by her family and friends as Kristen, Miss Bennett was born in New York and had since lived in the North Carolina area for more than 10 years. And on that very same day, another woman, Rhonda Jones, was found lifeless inside a trash can that was placed outside and was in close proximity to that of the same home where Bennett's remains were discovered. 
And just as the subsequent investigation into those homicides was going on, authorities then received yet another alert six weeks later on June 3rd. And this was for a woman named Megan Oxendine, who was found dead outside a house on East 8th Street. Born and raised in Lumberton, Oxendine had spent most of her life in the city. The news came as a shock to everyone in the community, and rumors of a serial killer on the loose further induced panic. Since then, authorities, including the FBI, have conducted extensive investigations to tackle the triple murder case. According to reports, there were at least 500 individuals who were interviewed, but not one of them ever led to a suspect or any further leads. Turning to forensic science, investigators still had their hands tied. They couldn't even determine exactly how any of the victims died considering that their bodies were too badly decomposed. And though an autopsy can provide leads as to the nature of their deaths, in this case, nothing could be certain. So far, the only fact police knew regarding the case was that the deceased were disposed of and discarded, meaning they most likely had been killed held for some time and then dumped in the areas where they were actually found. However, as to how they were killed, let alone who was responsible for these heinous crimes, the answers remain a mystery. All the information about these ladies has sort of been kept under wraps for fear of revealing too much, which could hinder in finding the actual killer. The Bennett Jones Oxendide murder cases remain open though, and the FBI is putting up a reward of $40,000 to anyone who could offer information leading to the discovery and apprehension of the culprits. And meanwhile, the dumping of the body stopped there, at least in this area. It appears, though, that a serial killer most likely was the culprit. They chose a place to get rid of their bodies and then either stopped killing or moved on to another dumping ground. Number 3. Judy Smith. For those that knew them, Jeffrey and Judith Smith exuded a loving relationship that most would envy. Despite finding themselves after first going through a couple failed marriages, Jeff and Judy, as they were called by friends and family, loved each other dearly. They enjoyed going out together to events. It could be something as simple as a basketball game or a night at the theater. They were practically inseparable. In fact, in April of 1997, Jeff was called to attend a conference in Philadelphia. As a legal representative for a big pharmaceutical company in Boston, his presence was needed there. And as expected, Judy decided to tag along. They planned that after the conference, they would meet up with longtime friends in New Jersey before finally heading back home to Massachusetts. On April 9th, the couple arrived at Logan International Airport for their flight to Philly, but just as they were about to board, Judy realized she had forgotten her driver's license and was forced to take a later flight. Everything went well, though, despite this little setback, and the two eventually met up in their hotel in Philadelphia later that night. The next day, while Jeff attended his conference, his wife went sightseeing around the city. They were supposed to convene later that evening at 5, but when it was getting close to 7 and she still wasn't around, Jeff went looking. He went back to the hotel, hoping to bump into her eventually. He then made his way back to the venue, thinking she could be there, but she wasn't, so it was back to the hotel. Upon his initial inspection, Jeff realized that most of Judy's travel belongings were still in their room, although her wallet, wedding band, engagement ring, and a red backpack were missing. The next he did was to try to trace back the route he believed his wife took that day. Still, though, no signs of her. And now desperate and concerned, Mr. Smith asked the town's mayor, who happened to be one of the attendees at the convention, to convince local police to take action. However, even with the law on his side helping look, Jeff still couldn't find a single trace of his wife. So the lawyer then eventually went home without his companion. But back in Boston, he continued his efforts in finding Judy. He faxed, mailed, and put up over 9,000 flyers around the state and in Philadelphia. He also hired three private investigators, but still nothing came of it. 
And five months after Mrs. Smith had vanished, a father and son stumbled upon a partially buried skeleton while hiking near Asheville, North Carolina. Authorities said the victim was a white female, probably in her mid-50s, which was around the same age as Judy. The pathologist's report also indicated that the woman incurred puncture wounds to the chest, suggesting she had been stabbed. After comparing dental records, police then announced that the remains were that of the missing Judy. No one understood how the Boston woman ended up dead in North Carolina. Most of her precious belongings were on her person, therefore ruling out robbery as the main motive. A few eyewitnesses would later come forward to reveal that she was in fact in the area. They described the woman as very pleasant and that they didn't see anything about her that would indicate that she wasn't right in any way. Several theories have come out, and one of the most intriguing ones pertains to a statement from a family friend who said that before her disappearance, Jeff and Judy had been dealing with a strained relationship that no one really knew about. They believe something might have happened that triggered her to distance herself from Jeffrey. Over this theory could not be entirely substantiated. As of now, no one has a clue as to the circumstances that led to Judy's murder in an isolated place in North Carolina. There remains a mystery as well as to who stabbed her and then left her in a shallow grave. Was it a random killing? Or was it a part of a scheme perpetrated by someone who wanted her gone? We don't know. Either option is equally strange and scary. If it were random, why wouldn't they take her jewelry? And how could she have been seen in North Carolina without showing any sense of fear? If it were to say, her husband, then he apparently planned and executed the perfect murder. Number 2. The Bladenboro Beast There are many ways to make a place popular. Generally, people do it by publicizing their town's best features. However, others, like the folks in Bladen County, had a strange way of putting their borough on the map. Bladen County is one of the oldest counties in North Carolina. It's mostly rural, and only a few towns like Bladenboro dot the landscape. Suffice to say, there was a point when no one really visited or even had heard of Bladenboro, and that is, until the attacks happened. In the late evening of December 29, 1953, in Clarkton, a small town just east of Bladenboro, a woman reportedly heard her neighbor's dogs barking frantically. Curious, she went outside to check and saw a large feline-like figure retreating into the darkness. And this would be considered the first ever sighting of what everyone now calls the Beast of Bladenboro. Because two days after that, the first attack actually happened. Two dogs were found dead in the town. There was a bloody side and the canines had been torn to shreds. Their heads completely ripped off their bodies and their skulls crushed. The following day, two more dogs helplessly fell victim to the Bladenboro Beast. One was mangled so badly it was hardly recognizable, and more and more shredded dogs showed up in the following days. Local police had grown so concerned about the incidents that they decided to conduct an autopsy on one of the dogs. The results showed terrifying details, including the fact that the canine's blood had been sucked out of its body. So it was as if a vampire of some sort had attacked the poor animal. News spread fast, and soon countless witnesses came forth to tell their stories about the creature that they had been scared to talk about upon fear of ridicule. According to those who have seen it, the beast of Bladenboro was a huge and terrifying monster. It was around five feet long with bushy hair, a long tail, and a large head with long, sharp fangs protruding from its mouth. The pointed ears and fiery-looking eyes added more to its menacing look. Some witnesses said it had a brownish and tabby-colored body, while others recounted seeing a nearly hairless feline. Days went by and locals continued to report their pets and livestock being mutilated. The same as the ones before, these animals had their blood sucked right out of them and their heads had been crushed. 
While the bees definitely seemed to prefer animals, it did try to attack a human once. It was in early 1954 when a certain Mrs. Kinslaw checked out a source of noise near her house. When she went out there, she saw a massive cat-like creature approaching her dogs. Upon seeing her presence, the beast turned its eyes on her and then rushed as if to attack. She screamed as loud as she could before running inside the house to get help from her husband. Apparently, though, it seemed like all their shouting worked because when they went back out, the monster had disappeared somewhere into the woods. After that, the Bladenboro beast never attacked another human again, or at least that's what the press said to try to keep people calm. However, there were theories suggesting that this might not be the case because around that time, there was an unsolved murder in the area. This suspicion came to be when investigators were told about a set of strange tracks found near the crime scene. And this lead, however, was never corroborated. Regardless, if this proved to be true, then it can be assumed that the Bladenboro Beast is in fact a danger not only to animals, but to humans as well. In light of these horrific events, more and more concerned individuals gathered in town to search and hunt for the elusive monster. And at one point, somewhere between 800 to 1,000 residents gathered to track it down. Within a few weeks, a few people came forward saying that they had killed or caught the beast. One was a farmer who found a bobcat struggling in a trap. Another man had a big cat with spots like a leopard with his car that he brought home. And professional hunter Barry Lewis was credited by many as having killed the beast after shooting it. The killings of dogs stopped after this, so it appears someone got the beast and that it may have been just a large bobcat. But the ferocious kills, head crushing, and blood suckings have yet to be explained. But... You can always go down and learn more about the incident in the town itself if you want. They hold an annual beast fest down there, and if you ask any locals, they have plenty of stories to tell. Number one, Dennis Etheridge. Not knowing the fate of a missing child must be a horrible pain. For the parents and loved ones of Dennis Etheridge, they had to wait more than four whole decades to find out what happened to him. In April of 1993, a man named Elton Mitchell stood on the Bailey Road Bridge in Kenley, a town in Wilson County, North Carolina. The 33-year-old was there looking for a lantern he lost the night before while catfishing. And using a homemade hook with a rope, he combed the 12-foot deep waters below, hoping to find that lamp. What he discovered instead was an object that he initially thought was a discarded turtle shell, but upon a closer look, he realized that it was a human skull. He called the authorities, and in the same spot where he drew out the skull, police were able to pull out a sunken bag with a rock inside of it. Investigators then surmised that the killer must have put the severed head in that bag with the rock to keep it weighed down at the bottom before tossing it over the bridge probably standing in the same spot as Elton. There were two small caliber gunshot holes in the back of the skull and major exit damage along the right side. Upon a further inspection, medical examiners deduce that the skull belongs to a white male somewhere between the ages of 17 and 22. They were estimated to be around 5 foot 8 inches tall while weighing in at 140 pounds. There were two notable missing persons at around the time the remains were found. The first was Timmy Watson, a 26-year-old drug dealer who disappeared in 1988. Another was Pelin Wink Mercer, a 35-year-old criminal who had vanished in 1989. But the skull did not belong to either of them, and it did not fit the profile. So the trail went cold for many years after that, and then... In 2019, 26 years after the gruesome discovery, a local newspaper wrote an article highlighting the case. And two years after that, in 2021, some keen readers pointed out that this could be Dennis Etheridge. Etheridge went missing from his home in Wilson County, North Carolina, way back in 1979, 
and he would have been around 21 or 22 years old when he simply vanished without a trace. Following up on this lead, detectives requested DNA samples from his family members, which then helped confirm his identity. The skull was Dennis's. Unfortunately, there's little to no information released about the personal background of the victim, but the family and friends of Etheridge now finally know that he perished tragically. What's left now is to find out who killed him and why, although that's a heavy ask considering it happened more than 43 years ago. So there were five bizarre murder mysteries from North Carolina for you to ponder. Hopefully there were some new cases in there for you that you hadn't heard of. We always strive to bring you new and interesting ones. If you enjoyed this video, please subscribe and give us a thumbs up. And don't forget to hit those notifications. Please go ahead and check out some more videos from us. Thank you so much for tuning in. We'll see you guys in the next one.